Is there anybody over there too? Okay, all right, we'll go to you guys next. You wanna take two in a row? Okay. Thank you so right. much, sir. Yeah, I would like to hear your perspective on how optimistic are you on US really gaining back this um, legitimacy and strength in the international system after the domino effect you mentioned that happened after President Obama uh, drew a red line about Syria and came back okay. out of it. Okay, all right, great. We'll take one more over here, yeah. I wanted to ask about cybersecurity and cyberspace in particular. And we've talked a lot about nations so far, but I was wondering what your thoughts were on how we address uh, identity issues with adversariality when it comes from sort of unknown cyber threats, things yeah. we cannot predict anymore, and new strategies for undermining international sovereignty and interests in cyberspace. Thank okay, you. great, great. Okay, to answer the first question, this is where I think all of you have a role, and so what I was gonna ask you at the end to do is, is to really be part of a movement that aims to understand better the nature of the challenges to national and international security. So the so what, like why do we care about it? And then, and then to have, use that better understanding as a basis for discussions about what our policies and strategies ought to be, right? Absent that kind of discussion, we have this vacillation, you know, between, you know, between inter intervention and disengagement, between over-optimism and resignation. And so, so I, I think that's really the, the first step. And it's important because if we can't execute long-term consistent policies not just our, our adversaries, but our friends are gonna have doubts about our competence and our ability to execute, and that's gonna to lead to hedging behavior. I'll just give you one example of this. Uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in the situation in the Syrian civil war and in Iraq, uh, our, the, the Gulf Arab states are being subjected to a, really a, a disinformation effort by, by Russia. I call it Putin's Potemkin peace plan. Okay, and, and what Putin is offering them, he's, and he's offering the same to Israel too, who's actually been biting on this too, which I can't understand why they would do it, but he, was, he would say, he's saying, hey, in exchange, in exchange for Assad staying in power, you know, of course, and thereby guaranteeing Russian interests in a post-Civil War Syria, hey, I'll work with you guys over time to diminish Iranian influence in Syria and across the region. Well. Of course, I mean, big surprise, it's a lie, right? But, but it's also infeasible because Assad is more reliant on Iran than he is on, 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 on Russia at this point. But why does this sell, right? Why does this sell to the to Israel? Because they're hedging. They want to maintain the relationship with Russia because they think the U.S. will disengage from the region. And then, of course, that's what the Obama administration did, and that's what President Trump has said Hey, at times. Hey, I went out of there, right? And, and so our inability to execute a sustained policy creates these opportunities, and then also um, for, for our en enemies, and then, and then we miss an opportunity to work together with, with like-minded partners whose interests actually align with ours uh, in, in, a con in a concerted manner, for in this case, to, to address the humanitarian crisis, to help try to end that civil war, and to do so in a way that, that allows for the enduring defeat of ISIS, right? Uh, and, uh, and, then, and then the kind of accommodations that need to happen within Syria to ensure that this, this, that this sectarian violence doesn't come back. And there's no way that can happen with Assad in power, right? So, so it's, I think what we need is we need to be able to, to sustain policies and strategies over time, and we have to do that by working together. I mean, this is not, this is not a partisan issue, right? I mean, there is a point at which democratic retrenchment meets Republican isolationism, right? And, and uh, sometimes, you know, you can, it's, it seems like one of the other parties like throwing their voice, right? Because they, they're, they're making the same, the, same kind of, the same kind of arguments. On, on cyber, I mean, you raise very important points, right? First is attribution, which I think is not that as, as hard as it used to be. I think we can attribute where attacks come from. But the problem is how do you deter a cyber attack if you're unable to really place something of value to the attacker at risk? And so, of course, a nation state, you can place something of value to that nation state at risk. Uh, and, and so you have, I think, increasing dangers associated with attacks on infrastructure, attacks on financial systems, and, and so forth, uh, based on those that are much, uh, attackers who are much more difficult uh, to, to deter by the threat of punitive action on the, on the back end. That's why I think effective security in cyber and effective deterrence 
cannot only happen in cyberspace, right? Now, in cyberspace, you need, you know, what, what some people are, are calling, uh, you know, an active defense in depth, right? Which means that on your networks, you have to, you can't just, you can't just secure the, the, the perimeter of that network. But then also, I think increasingly, even private companies, big corporations, are going to have to conduct really reconnaissance in cyberspace to identify those that are trying to attack them or putting, you know, or, 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 or um, actually penetrating their networks with the intention maybe of attacking uh, in, in the future. And then even more and better cooperation, you know, between, you know, between uh, Cyber Command, NSA, uh, and, and the private sector, maybe modeled even more on what, what we see in the financial sector. But the, but the, the costs we impose on, on cyber actors have to be law enforcement costs. And, and maybe in, in certain circumstances, you could think of, uh, of, of military force if it would be authorized and legal to do so. So it's, it can't just be, uh, or economic sanctions, financial sanctions, and, and so forth. The other concern, I think, is, is not just on, on um, you know, super empowered individuals uh, and, and organizations, terrorist organizations, but also hostile states. What, Iran, for example, right? So uh, Iran, if it comes to the point where Iran thinks, hey, I'm, I might not have that much to lose, right? Um, you know, would, would Iran conduct uh, an attack in cyberspace against, against uh, infrastructure? If the regime feels like it's about to lose power or something like that. So I think these are, you know, these are really um, important questions you raise. I think that um, some of the modifications that have been made now to how we conduct cyber defense are, are, have been helpful uh, and we're a lot more effective. Part of it had to do with decentralization of, of the effort. Yes, we'll go in the, in the far back. Okay, and then and then here too. I'll take two in a row again. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm just wondering how would we execute a sustained strategy given certain tactical deteriorations that, um, that the National Security Report addresses, in particular purchasing stagnation, procurement stagnation, erosion of national manufacturing, and you know, building the very weapons and weapon systems that our military relies on. Okay, all right. And there's, there's one more here, I think. Thank you, sir, for coming in today. I recently read the book Drift by Rachel Maddow where she talks about one of the problems with the military, if there is a problem of overextension, is that the bureaucratic hurdles to implement it and use it overseas have been reduced via the privatization of parts of the military, the uh, expansion of the executive powers of the president, as well as, as you talked about, the uh, decreasing number of the civilian population that participate in the military have reduced the uh, accountability of the military to the political will of the people and to Congress. And I'm wondering, do you think that is a problem in that the military is overused or it can be overused because it's unaccountable to the people? Or do you disagree with the premise? Yeah. Well, I think it's something to keep an eye on for sure. I don't, I don't think it's a problem now uh, in terms of you know, a constitutional crisis or, or that the military has become disconnected from our society in, in a way that is, uh, you know, um, you know particularly serious, but I do think that, that there's, there is a drift. I mean, you know, the, if the title of the book is, is, is uh, consistent with the argument, the, the drift is from the military becoming more disconnected from those in whose name, you know, our warriors fight and serve, right? And, um, and that is, that is uh, I think, important for a couple of reasons. First, uh, first of all, as you mentioned, you know, the, the, you know, the use of, of force, right? And, and, uh, and the importance of, of really war, considering war as a, as a contest of wills and generating the, the popular will to, to really sustain, you know, the costs and the sacrifices of war is, is essential to winning, right? And, and you know, I mean, there isn't a second place prize in combat, I don't think, you know, and I think that, that part of the problem is that we have, you know, we have considered, along with some of these other assumptions since the end of the Cold War, that you know, hey, winning in war is passe, right? You know, it's okay just to go and you know muddle muddle through. Actually, it's not okay. In fact, as I mentioned, it's not only counterproductive to not try to win in war because actually, in war, each tr side tries to outdo the other, right? Uh, but it's important to win a war as, as essentially a contest of wills because winning requires essentially convincing your enemy that your enemy cannot accomplish his objectives through through the use of violence, right? And so. 
if, if your enemy doesn't think you have the will to see it through because you announce years in advance, your withdrawal, for example, uh, then, that, then, I mean, how is that going to, to, to come out in a way that's, that's beneficial to the American public and then also achieves an outcome that's worthy uh, of, the, of the risks and sacrifices that our young men and women are making in, in combat? You know, a lot of times you, you hear people say, well, you know, I don't support the war, but I support the troops. I mean, I, I don't understand how that works, actually. You know, and, and I think that we, we should, you know, have, you know, we should um, endeavor, leaders should endeavor, civilian leaders in particular should endeavor to explain to the American people what is at stake and then also um, what is the strategy? What is the strategy that will deliver an outcome, right, at a cost acceptable to the American public? And that's what's missing. Okay, I mean, I... I mean, I think, I, I believe, and you know, I'm biased about this because I worked on it, but I believe we put in place the first strategy in Afghanistan that connected really what we were doing militarily to what we wanted to achieve politically and did it at a resource level and a, and a risk level and a cost level in terms of human life as well as, 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 as financial cost that, that was sustainable over time and explicable to the American public. I don't think we have we have that any, anymore. Um, and and um, and the other the other aspect of this is that if if Americans become disconnected from their warriors, they won't understand what are or what are the requirements for an effective military, and therefore won't to get to your question, uh, you know won't 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 equip the military uh, or support the ethos that the military needs to fight and win in, in, in combat. Um, I do worry about how popular culture uh, cheapens and coarsens the warrior ethos. Um, Hollywood tells us little about why warriors fight, uh, why they make sacrifices. Um, you see uh, veterans portrayed mainly as traumatized, fragile human beings. Uh, you, oftentimes you see our forces portrayed in war. I mean, this is the New York Times op-ed that comes out, you know, the one on war every few weeks, um, as, as, as passive recipients uh, of enemy actions rather than those who actually have agency uh, in combat and, and oftentimes demonstrate prowess uh, in, in the righteous application of violence uh, against the enemies of all civilized people. I mean, I, I, think, that, uh, I think that our society in some ways uh, has, is now treating you know, victimhood as the new heroism, you know, for, for example, um, and no longer celebrates really what warriors achieve. And so um, I believe these are all dangers. So what can you do? I think go see your recruiter is the first thing you could do <laughs> uh, because you, you could, uh, I'm sure they have something for you. Um, and and I, I think that if, for those of you who do, are considering service in the military, it is immensely rewarding. Right, you see, you see the downside. You see the sacrifices, the long separations, you know, the physical risk. Uh, the the toughest part of it is the loss of comrades, those who you love. Uh, but what you don't see, and it is hard to see from the outside, is are the less tangible rewards of service. Being part of something bigger than yourself, and being part of an organization in which the man or woman next to you is willing to give everything, including their own lives, for you. I mean, that's really hard to replicate uh, anywhere else. Uh, and, and you don't have to do it full time. I mean, you could join the reserves, uh, but then also other forms of services, you know, are available in our, in our government. And so I, I think as a young person, it's the time to do it. it. The time to serve is when you're younger. And then you have, you have your whole life in front of you. I mean, there's a tendency sometimes I think to say, okay, hey, I need to plan out my whole life because, you know, I, I mean, I want it to be perfect and have the right career, perfect thing, everything. Hey, it, it's gonna work out. So do something fun and rewarding and then, and then let it take you where it's going to take you because your service at an early age will open up tremendous opportunities for you later uh, in, in service or in the private sector or anything. So um, I think that's one way to do it. On procurement and, and, um, and, and defense capabilities, I believe that the biggest danger now is that we could be on the path to exquisite irrelevance because as our adversaries are, are, are uh, developing countermeasures to our most sophisticated capabilities, we're investing more and more money in less and fewer and fewer exquisite systems that I think are vulnerable to these countermeasures. So I think we need simpler systems and we probably need a greater capacity scale in our force uh, than, than we have 
and, uh, and we have to think differently, I think, about defense capabilities in the, you know, in the coming years. The, the uh, impediment to that is the military industrial complex, which I think is as strong as it ever has been. And of course, they're incentivized, right, to, you know, for these big ticket items, right? I mean, the, you know, so the, our, you know, the, I mean, the fighter aircraft and, 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 and aircraft carriers and big ships and everything, I mean, it, that's, that's a lot of money. It's also a lot of profits that are spread around across many different states. Uh, and and therefore gain more support in Congress. I mean, you know the, you know the whole the the the, the um, you know the situation with the military industrial complex. But I think uh, I think we're at a critical moment that we need to do rethink our our capabilities, how we develop the future force. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.